Welcome to Nostalgia, your favorite pop culture podcast where we have deep conversations about superficial things. I'm Nicole, your host, and each week we unlock core memories from the 90s, 2000s, and beyond while examining the past through a contemporary lens. Our guests are pop culture tastemakers who explore how our formative experiences shape how we see the world. We talk about trends, fashion, music, identity, consumer behavior, societal attitudes, and more. Nostalgia is a reminder of how our individual and collective memories make us feel like we belong. And if you like Nostalgia, be sure to follow, subscribe, rate, review, and share with a friend who loves pop culture as much as we do. Plus, we have a lot of fun. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nostalgia. I'm excited. I have Andy here with me today, who is a writer and expert on everything 90s, music, sports. And I'm so excited because you have a new book too, 90 Days in the 90s. And so I want to hear all about it. Yeah, well, where do we start? Um, it, the 90 Days in the 90s uh, came out in June. And um, yeah, I'm 50 years old, so I remember the 90s pretty well, I was in my 20s, and I had just moved to Chicago in 1994. So um, musically, it was kind of in the middle of alternative and grunge and indie, you know, being mainstream on the radio. And you know, I grew up in high school. Uh, I went to high school in the 80s, graduated in the 90s. So, you know, when I was in 10th grade, it was I turned on the radio and, you know, on a good day, on a really good day, I might hear a little bit of The Cure and The Pixies, but primarily it was, you know, Bon Jovi and Debbie Gibson and New Kids on the Block and a lot of... Um, 80s hair metal and stuff that was, you know, sort of dictated from, I guess, executives in L.A. and overproduced and, you know, somewhere. I don't think it was a flick of a switch, but there was at least a gradual movement towards, um, you know, artists that wrote their own music and played their own instruments and, and not just, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam, but, you know, artists like uh, Alanis Morissette and, you know, uh, Jewel and all, all kinds of different avenues of music so uh when i moved here to chicago you know, kurt cobain had passed smashing pumpkins was probably the biggest band in the world but there's a lot of there's a vibrant indie scene here in chicago and bands that had you know they'd played in bars and they'd played in the college circuit like ruka salt and local h and material issue and so on so there's definitely a vibrant music scene and i always remember that and you know, when you're 20 you're 22 and you're living in an apartment with a couple of people you know usually you have a couple of nickels to rub together, you're eating ramen noodles every night, but you know, it was a priority to go see bands and you know, part with 13 or 15 bucks to go see um, an artist that you had maybe heard on the radio or read about in a zine. Or... So the music scene was really, uh, just because we weren't in LA or New York or Austin, um, I felt like the music scene was very vibrant here and I wanted to write a book about that. So th basically my book, 90 Days in the 90s, is about, um, it starts in the present, it's about a record store to, owner named Darby who kind of like has her, her life and her career fall apart in New York. She moves back to Chicago, takes over her favorite uncle's record store after he passes and then gets really into the, into music and nostalgia. And uh, here's about a time travel train that goes back to the past and decides to d basically disembark for the mid nineties in part to kind of do some things over and to fix some things, but then just gets caught up in the music scene, caught up in her twenties, uh, caught up in everything that the nineties was about and, you know, kind of doesn't deal with her stuff. And then the, the subplot is that she's just really immersed in uh, the 1990s and music scene. And that's where the subplot and the, all the fun stuff really starts to happen. That sounds really fun. If you were able to take a train and travel back in time to a particular music scene, when would it be? A certain year or maybe a certain show you would want to see or relive or one that you didn't see the first time around? But yeah. you wish you had yeah i mean well that's all the premise of the book i, I suppose I, I would have to think about it if there's like one destination because they're, they're probably it's kind of like if you ask who my favorite band is there's about 50 of them it depends on what mood i'm in what day which one of those top 50 bands i'm in the mood to listen to um because i'm not like a, a beatles or a stones person who said like you know i'm, I'm only going to listen to that so th that's how the, the idea came about I, I would say you know i would probably be in the middle 90s somewhere I, and to me i might just go kind of hang out walk around by myself for a weekend and be an observer and 
Uh, but but I also know I would, you know, because the way I am, I would get in a conversation with someone in the elevator about, like, sports or music or whatever. That's just how I am. But uh, Darby, you know, she goes back to 1996. It's actually, she leaves. She, she goes back to the day that she actually, the same day that she actually left to Chicago to move away to New York. Uh, I guess what prompted that idea was um, I was just walking around one day listening to music uh, about five years ago. And I'm, I don't remember what I was listening to, but I, I did have that inkling that you just kind of said where I thought, well, oh, wouldn't it be great to see this show or this band, right? I never got to see James Brown while he was alive. And I remember he came to the, the I think he opened the um, House of Blues here in Chicago around New Year's Day, probably 1996, if I remember right. Um, so, like, things like that. You would, you don't have to time travel to go save the world or prevent a disaster from happening. I think a lot of us, if we just had a ticket to ride for a week or even 90 days, that we would probably visit personal things and just kind of want to see if what we remember is, is still as it was and, and enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. When did you start to see really that transition and that genre shift from that late 80s to early 90s to then even mid 90s time? Because yep. I know for me, I, I definitely feel that about the 2000s where the early 2000s and the late 2000s almost seem like two different decades, but also just my specific age and just like the school that you're in and yep. things like that. It can totally shape experiences for people differently we I, I just apologize because i'm sipping my coffee which is a very 90s thing to be like immersed in addicted coffee. <laughs> i do remember when there you know it was i, I drank coffee probably just to, to to like stay awake and then all of a sudden there's a starbucks in every block you know in, in the mid 90s but there's a lot of stuff that happened like that where we tend to think that it, musically the 90s started with nirvana's release of nevermind and smell it's like teen spirit but i would say having graduated high school in 1990 I was, and just being like averse to, you know, radio pop and hair metal, I, I guess I never had um, an older sibling, but I always, I had a lot of friends in high school who had like an older brother or sister that went to like the University of Delaware or Princeton because they grew up in the East Coast. And they would always come back with mixtapes. And I would bug these friends like, I want a copy of that. You know, what, what's your brother listening to, your sister listening to up and away at college? And um, so it was kind of gradual. I mean, I do think that... I listened in the late, very late 80s. There was like the Pixies and the Cure were on the radio and they had major label um, record deals. So you would hear them in like the B-52s release Cosmic Thing in 89. And they had been around, like I didn't know who they were. I had never been to Athens, Georgia. I'd never been to like a, a, sh a bar at a college, but you know, um, they were there and then they started to get recognized and played on the radio because their stuff is fun and crazy and radio friendly. So it was really more of a gradual thing than we tend to... Um, describe in history, we, we'd really give all the credit to like your grunge and Nirvana for breaking the back of terrible radio pop. But it was really a more of a gradual thing. Like in, in 1990, 91, before Nirvana, let's say early 91, the biggest hard rock band in the world was Living Color. Um, you know, these four black guys from the Bronx who went to prep school together and, you know, one, they were kind of jazz and progressive rock influence, but they rocked and they had a really good radio single and they played on SNL just like all the you know, just like Lizzo did a year and a half ago. And so the structure was the same, but I think uh, maybe people just got tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. So it was really more gradual than we tend to remember. But also it wasn't just about grunge and only that. Or I mean, there was all kinds of different subgenres of music that had their own explosion, their own epiphany. I had somebody the other night ask me about country. And I, you know, I don't listen to a lot of country, but I, I do recognize that we went from uh, an 80s scene, which was very, what they called it, pop country, where it was very radio friendly and focused on kind of imitating the, I guess, the country sound of the 70s and 60s to a landscape where we had these superstars like, you know, like it or not, Garth Brooks, Shania Twain, uh, Faith Hill, who were writing their own songs at their, uh, at their own, you know, just kind of calling their own shots and doing their own thing. And, and you know, that was very 90s too. It wasn't just only about the hard rock and the alternative and the you know, Alice in Chains and, and Soundgarden, there was, it really, music just had its, uh, all kinds of tentacles that appealed to everybody. I think that overall the industry, I think, got larger, but it gave uh, a creative a, a way so that, you know, bands that never would have made it before, and i give you a couple examples if you want, you know, were on people's radar immediately when they released good material. 
Yeah, I would say something about the 90s, too, that I always think of as kind of the, I guess you could say emergence, although it might have been earlier, I'm not sure, but kind of like the emergence of college radio yep. and independent radio. And so I want to hear your thoughts on that. I don't know if it's because maybe Gen X was going to college more than baby boomers were, or, you know, there hadn't really been an independent college radio scene that was thriving before the 90s what do you think about that well i mean if you look if you study punk a little bit there was all you know before there were websites and blogs we had these things called zines and i did one you know briefly where you would review bands and write your own stuff and get together with a couple friends and then you'd pony up 200 dollars and you'd go to the printer who would print you know it was it would be it looked like a newspaper be black and white and you know newsprint and it looked official but also kind of edgy at the same time. And I remember when Tower Records in the mid nineties, like they had all, you could buy obviously Entertainment Weekly and Rolling Stone and all that stuff. And then they had all like a, you know, at least a rack, um, at least a top shelf of rack that had like 20 zines in it. And, and so it was kind of a nod to the fact that there was an underground and that it was important. And, and, you know, if you study music history, you think about, there are artists that kind of came up through an independent channel. So if you an example, like, so the Runaways were a moderate success. Uh, in the late 70s, and some people wrote them off. I actually love the Runaways, but some people wrote them off as like a girl band, uh, kind of kitschy, um, just showpiece. So when Joan Jett left and she went independent, um, yeah, she actually, you know, she, I, I think the story is on her that she got turned down by 10 major record companies and then released an independent, actually, but I love rock and roll. A lot of people don't know that's a cover song by a, a band called The Arrows from Boston. And uh, she released it. Uh, Rodney Bingenheimer, who is a radio DJ in LA, had her, and you know people like her on all the time, and it just blew up. And I think it was, you know, it was at the same time that MTV popped up, and they needed material, and you know there was only probably I don't know a couple dozen artists that had it on their mind, like let's create a video, whatever a video is, like let's do a, a visual piece for our music, and it hit the right time. And she, you know, independent label, um, biggest song in the world in 1981, and Joan Jett became a, a superstar by getting, you know, getting turned down by the industry and major, I mean, it's, it's not like she didn't have a track record, like she couldn't have got a record deal, she just didn't, but, you know, exploded anyway. So there's a lot of little stories like that that come from the punk scene. And I think college radio, you know, it's probably, I, I used to listen to WPRB, because um, Princeton was not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in Southeast Pennsylvania. So yeah, obviously Princeton had enough of a, you know, a, I guess a journalism program that they threw a couple thousand dollars a year at this radio station, let the students run it and, you know, to let them get experience to see what it'd be like to be on a radio. And they, rather than imitate the major rock stations or the soft pop or whatever, they, they created their own thing. And people obviously were interested in the, in the variety that came from it. So I, I think it just was an organic thing that grew that by the time 90, 1992, 1991 rolled around, and you had Nirvana getting signed to David Geffen's record label. I mean, remember, he basically gave us Guns N' Roses and a bunch of stuff before that, that, um, you know, people were ready for what seemed like a new flavor, a new approach, but there had been the inner workings of that, you know, before that for, for people who were attuned to something besides whatever played on the, the, the top 40. So, yeah, lots of underground stuff that kind of worked its way to the top, and um, once people gave it a chance, it blew up. What do you think of the word sellout? We talked about this a little bit in the Nostalgia episode with Barbara Barna Abel because this is very much a Gen X kind of ethos. At least that is kind of its yeah. its reputation or how it's portrayed. And I read Dan Ozzy's book from this year <laughs> called Sell Out, and each chapter yeah. is about whether it's Green Day, whether it's the Donnas, and even when the Donnas 2002 album came out, I remember just seeing the album cover and it was them at a sleepover. And yeah. at the time I was like, wow, that's so cool. These girls, I mean, obviously they were not, you know, 12 years old, but I was like, wow, this is so cool. It's like they're girls just like me and we could have a sleepover and it could be fun, but it's still rock music. Yeah. And that was something that, contrast a little bit from like otherwise the bubblegum pop explosion of that time um but yeah anyway back to the concept of just like that 
of selling out and if that's really a thing or if it was like every generation just like the thing that kind of just like a rhetoric that got blew out of proportion well generation x it, it's true but we I joke about that we are a little obsessed with authenticity maybe to a fault that we were you know we joke about the uh the, you know, the hipster who's listened to who's heard bands that haven't even been formed yet you know they're, they're that on the radar I don't know, Boris, I, I would, I try not to criticize uh, millennials too much, but I mean, millennials are kind of more wired to what's what's trending and what do I need to be aware of? It's more kind of a maven um, attitude. So, I, you know, we it's Steve Albini, I heard him, I remember, so he's a local here in Chicago. Um, he's got something to say about everybody and everything, but I remember years and years ago, he's been interviewed by Q101. It was like when Q101 were playing the top albums that were on the charts, but they were still interviewing like local producers, indie producers and yeah, you know, he produced um, some work with uh, Nirvana. Anyway, he said, he said something to the effect of like, if you you like the first Green Day album, but you you don't want to listen to the second or third Green Day album, then that you know you're making a choice there. That's more like your socio political approach. It has nothing because because um, Dookie sounds just like her plunk, really. It's not overproduced, and I'm pretty I'm pretty critical of. Like, I think the guys from Imagine Dragons seem like cool dudes. I'd like to have, I don't they're Mormons, so I don't know if they drink, but I'd like to, like, hang out and have a beer with them. But I don't want to hear them. Because <laughs> their music, to me, and the Killers, too, are very overproduced. I think mm -hmm. that's what matters, that, um, you know, how much is the artist really dictating what goes on the final album? I suppose there are probably some artists who get to a point where they're so, you know, I hope it's not this way, but they're, they're so big and they're so successful that they just kind of say, yeah, Mr. Producer go whatever comes out that's that's good but like the first oasis album um supposedly the guys if you watch the documentary on oasis like they were trying to get the sound the live sound that they had the raucous loud in your face live sound and they just couldn't do it they couldn't figure it out and they hired a, a sound guy owen morris who just knew the board better and knew how to produce it so it sounded like they wanted to so sometimes there is um obviously there's value to having you know industry people and sound people you know, kind of finish the product. But, you know, I'm a writer, so I don't I don't ever want to go the route of James Patterson where I've got a team of people. Okay, if I'm writing a historical novel, I probably want to talk to a historian to kind of get my facts straight and give me perspective because I'm not a historian. That's different than having a workshop of people kind of writing portions of your novel, teaming up with somebody to produce a novel every nine months or whatever it is, the way that Kiss, you know, put out an album every nine months back in the 70s. So I think it really has to do with the approach. There's always going to be people who are naysayers who say, you know, well, this band that I liked is more famous now, so they're sellouts. I don't think that that's necessarily really true. Um, I'm glad Liz Fair went back to kind of her more independent studio sound because her fourth album was very, you know, major label, big produced sound. And I remember she went from, you know, clubs in Chicago like Metro or wherever she played to playing the stadiums. And I think... I want to say in the last year she's played the empty bottle, which is about the size of my living room, and the tickets sold out. And you know, she's done; she's gone back to that, luckily, and gone back to being guitar focused. But you know, I don't know. I, maybe it was just the producer she was with who's like, you know, let's just put this thing out. It's a little, a little more radio friendly. Let's make you some money. Let's kind of get you out there to, to newer fans. It didn't feel authentic when her fourth album came out, but you know, she didn't. I, I, I at the same time, it's not like I loved Fall Out Boy's first single and some of their earlier stuff but mm -hmm. when you're chopping up you know bits from like the theme songs from the monsters and tv shows to fit in your single <laughs> right. how much are you really writing how much is that really authentic i guess it's the, you got to feel the pulse of how your fans feel and whether they feel like they've been forgotten about uh sellout can you know i guess it's a long answer but sellout can mean a bunch of different things i don't think it it's bad to you go to the next level and, and expand your audience it's, as long as you're not betraying the music and your artistry wholesale to do it that's the main thing yeah I, I think a lot about fandom in general and how a lot of fans don't actually want their idols to grow and evolve yeah. and sometimes when that like you mentioned it depends on where the authenticity lies is it because the artist wants to try something different or is it because the artist is being told by the record label or you know their music is being yeah overly produced and that takes it to somewhere that it really didn't need to go but i love that you mentioned liz fair because her fourth album was how i discovered her and i think that 
being a millennial, it was like that was a lot of millennials first exposure to yeah. Liz Fair. I do think that most people probably could name one song of hers and that's it. But for me, that was actually where I went down the rabbit hole and because of the internet and the availability of yeah. music. And this was, I guess, when people were still using LimeWire and downloading songs off the internet. Uh, that was that kind of was my rabbit hole. And so from there, that was when I could actually have access to her earlier music. And then also people like Fiona Apple and Tori Amos. And yeah. I wouldn't have had access to that music firsthand in the 90s, I guess, unless that was something that your parents listened to. Um, I wouldn't have had it. And so to be able yeah. to begin to listen to all of that music I think that it, it just adds another level I think that I love a lot of different genres of music and it can be so rich when you do explore things that are beyond maybe what you would have found on your own I think on one hand there's the kind of hipster like oh well I'll find the thing first and it's gonna yep. be cool because I say it's cool but I like to remain curious, too, in exploring things and how you said about getting mixtapes from friends. It's like that opens your eyes yeah. in a way that you found something that you wouldn't have otherwise found on your own. And I think that having that curiosity, maintaining that so you're always able to discover not necessarily new artists, but even yeah. just new things. There's so many layers there. Yeah, I, I feel like um, I got asked, I was on a hip hop um, podcast, and actually, I think I held my own. Uh, I was asked uh, kind of like this or that, like I was asked, um, you know, which artists do you prefer a, a couple of times? And I got asked, what, what do you think between Drake and J. Cole? And to me, I know a lot of people like Drake, but I don't, it, it, access is interesting because, yeah, you want people, obviously some people are really curious about music. Um, it's interesting if you listen to the Donnas, to me, they sound like Kiss and Steve Miller, but I wonder how many people who are really into the Donnas would be like, okay, I need to find out something. Let's see what the Steve Miller band was like. Um, yeah, I think probably Donnas fans probably also listen to maybe Liz Fair, Slater, Kinney. If they're really going down the independent record rabbit hole, if you're listening to Slater, Kinney, you, you find yourself listening to Bratmobile and songs about like asshole boyfriends and like in worse terms than I'm saying it now. But uh, with Drake, I feel like, uh, you know, Access is interesting because he obviously brings a lot of people to the fold to listen to hip hop. But he's talking about, you know, being rich and being famous and, um, you know, private airplanes. And I, J. Cole isn't talking about that. He's kind of talking about being disappointed by his idols like Kanye going that way. So, um, I, you know, I can't I, I'm not going to knock artists for what they want to do, because obviously it's, it's hard to be an artist in America whether you're a guitar player or a rapper and to make a success of it. But I do feel like there is, there are artists that, that have a different, that every artist has its their own way of speaking. And I think the question is whether or not the fans, are you, are you preaching for the radio and for the moguls or, or are you preaching your stuff for the people who are going to pay 15 bucks or 65 bucks now, you know, with us Gen, Gen Xers going to see bands like to come see you, uh, I don't know. I feel I feel like that that is an important thing, and you know, I I love L7. I'm actually wearing an L7 uh, hoodie right now. I've seen them three times, and they've gone from like being on Lollapalooza to breaking up because you know they were barely making enough money to survive to finding their way to just you know, I think what a lot of bands are doing, a lot of bands have been around are doing now. Like they know they're not going to make money on their record, so they're going to put out a record, put out new material, but they're going to focus on touring and getting their fans to see them, and that's everything from like '90s bands like. Uh, Local H is touring right now, um, L7, but also like bands from the 80s like English Beat. I've seen them a couple of times, and you know they're from Birmingham, England, and I think some of it is that they form relationships with venues, and you know, yeah, we want to play that club in Chicago again because it was great, and they come and make a couple thousand bucks, and they do that hopefully 30, 40 times over a year and continue to make a good living being artists versus having to go get a job at, you know, at a call center somewhere. So there's a nice balance that has to be reached. Uh, I think that there are some artists that have gotten big that sometimes have gotten too big and forget their fans and 
others that like I don't think that Bruce Springsteen forgets his fans. Even though uh, I was in New York a couple of years ago with my son is 16 now, but I think he was 14 at the time, and he's like, Dad, we should go see uh, Springsteen because he's playing the, basically a nightly show at the Walter Kerr Theater in in Midtown or maybe a little bit north of Hell's Kitchen. And I was like, Do you got 1,500 bucks? Because I don't, you know, but I'd mm-hmm. love to see him. Um, obviously, there's a different price point, but I, I, he's not Springsteen's not trying to do uh, you know like there's a while where Axl Rose was trying to do the the techno thing and even Bob Mould who's I love Husker Du and I love Sugar was trying to do the techno thing you never heard Springsteen try to do that thing because it was cool for a while so I, yeah, I could go on all day about that but I think it's really like how much are you still connected with your fans and that's the main thing that you should be considered as you grow as an artist not just growing just you know or doing a pick up a new subgenre just to do something different or whatever yeah the genre transitions like we were saying before were definitely more subtle and gradual than it's you know it's very easy to look back and see mm-hmm. you know be able to group five or ten year periods but in the moment it's gradual do you feel that same way about the commercialization of music as well and the commodification of music and the fact that you could go see certain artists for $15 yeah. back in the day. And now it's, it's not just gone up naturally. It's, it's totally kind of like disproportioned was, has that been gradual also? It's interesting. So you brought up the nineties and how that maybe the second half of the nineties was different. Um, I think about female artists and the ones that kind of popped up in the early nineties were, were, were oriented around punk. Like L7 was a good example or, Um, maybe less famous like Babes in Toyland. And then when we get to past, let's say, 1996, the focus is really on Alanis Morissette and then the whole Lilith tour thing with Sean, like nobody knew that Sean Colvin was going to be on a stage with, you know, following Sheryl Crow or the Indigo Girls. And I don't, you know, I think um, that was put in place, I think, because they knew that there are fans who wanted to see those bands that you, Music Fest just shouldn't be only about you know, punk bands and hardcore bands and, you know, uh, crowd surfing and jumping off stage and, you know, uh, there's there's that. So I feel like um, for as much as we might want to criticize making a product of music at the same time, you, you talked about access before. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that people who are kind of into femme folk and uh, even though I don't like Paula Cole, that people could go see her no matter what city they lived in if they wanted to, to jump into the Lilith tour. And then they also got to see maybe the Indigo Girls for the first time or got to see Cheryl Crow, which, you know, Cheryl Crow could fill a stadium on her own today, even though she hasn't put out a new album in a while. That was a cool aspect of it. So, I, you know, I guess as artists grow and they get more in demand, uh, there can be a higher price point for the tickets. But, you know, there's all at the same time in Chicago, there's all kinds of new venues that didn't exist 20 years ago. So I went to, there's a, a bar, it's, it's a small venue called Sleeping Village. It's been open for a couple of years. Um, the band Mama came out of L.A. I think they relocated to Brooklyn. But they sound to me, like they're very rock-oriented. They they said on stage, like, our biggest influences are the Breeders and we love Kim Deal. To me, they sound a little bit like that. They sound a little bit like Rook Assault and Local H and some just indie rock bands from the 90s. And I saw them for 13 bucks. I mean, I remember when they, they came out, I heard about them probably in February of this year when their album came out. I heard about them through local radio. And then when I found they were going on tour, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting two tickets because 13 bucks, hell yes. And then uh, Q101 just blogged about them this week as, as like one of the bands that if you weren't paying attention, you probably missed that also had a great album in 2022. So you just got to expect that. But I, I remember in the 90s, like when Culture Club got back together and they played Metro in Chicago. And I want to say the tickets, you know, let's say in 2022 prices was, was probably like, 27 35 bucks it wasn't insurmountable and you may not be a, a culture club super fan but if you like 80s music or you're like yeah i want to stand you know 20 feet away from boy george wearing his coolest you know, whatever hat he's wearing that they like decked out being boy george people wanted to see that so uh yeah i think that you just got to kind of roll with it and pick your poison and there's going to be some artists that you know you, you never get to see because of the price point but you know, like i obviously wasn't going to be able to get Tickets like my music industry friends to see Smashing Pumpkins play at Metro, you know, basically a, a really closed, not a closed show, but like a hard to get to show two months ago. But I saw them at Riot Fest last year and I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Riot Fest. They resurrect James Brown 
and put them on the stage, you know, as a zombie hologram. <laughs> I'm going to go to Riot Fest that day just to see him and whoever else they play. And, uh, you know, just, there's so much out there now. I do feel like there's a lot of variety and, like you said, a lot of access that you just got to be willing to, to go see. Yeah. I have one more question for you. You are a writer and you have interviewed hundreds of different people. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always say with this podcast, it's not about the celebrities themselves. This podcast isn't about a particular movie or TV show or even genre of music. It's it's about us. It's about creators. It's about fans. It's about people who feel like a part of something because they're united and, and connected to a certain aspect of culture so which interview that you've done has impacted you the most whether it was someone whose music inspired you or just a conversation that made a light bulb go off in your head not like who's your favorite celebrity but ultimately like what experience have you had that that allowed you to kind of move forward in life in a mm -hmm. different way well, so I write a lot about sports, and there's been a couple um, opportunities. Um, yeah, it kind of. So I just built up. Like I went from about ten or twelve years ago interviewing, you know, doing writing about high school football for ESPN Chicago, and then interviewing the, obviously the, the the student athletes to interviewing Tom Brady at the beginning of this year. So it's really blossomed. And it's not like I'm anybody, but people, I guess, mostly publicists will see my stuff and send me opportunities and ideas. I obviously take them if I'm interested in the the athlete. I, so I don't know. I mean, maybe stick to a music end of it. Um, about, I want to say, yeah, I think it was like two, 2011. It was probably 2012 when Billy from Smashing Pumpkins was starting his first wrestling league. And I was blogging for a site called Chicago Now at the time, which was owned by the Chicago Tribune. They just shut it down this year. But back then it was like, whatever you want to write about, go ahead. And it was a nice little community. And I remember the community manager at the time said, you know, you may have heard on on this uh, news broadcast that Billy from Fashion Pumpkins is starting this wrestling league. He's like, don't email me about it, but here's the publicist who you want to try to get an interview. Good luck. And so it, like, well, like within 20 minutes of seeing that poster, that email may be sent around that I'm writing my email, you know, to the publicist to say, you know, Hey, I don't know if there's an interest, but I'd like to see if I could get something on ESPN about, Billy's new wrestling league. And I kind of knew that Billy Corgan was a, was a, was a sports fan. Like he's a diehard Cubs fan, Bears fan. I've met him, I think in person twice. And the second time he was wearing his, you know, Chicago Bears, number one custom, you know, Corgan Jersey with his name <laughs> on the back. So obviously he's a big sports fan. So I got to interview him actually twice total, but the, the so just like what it said to me was, um, you know, go after what you want. Don't be afraid. You write a, what you think is a dinky little blog. It doesn't mean you can't get, you know, a, a rock star or somebody who's really important in, you know, a certain field to speak to you. Because, you know, yeah, you might not be able to get, if you're writing a pop music blog, you might not be able to get Justin Bieber. But, you know, you could probably get Alice Merton or somebody who's just as awesome, who's maybe a little bit less famous, who's doing something cool right now. So I remember that um, just thinking, like, I don't know if I'm going to get this guy, but I'm going to try and then before the, the before the end of the day, I had an interview time slot booked to talk to Billy. So let's say so it's Thursday now. Let's say it was a Thursday. I'd be like, oh, I got I get the schedule for Monday, which is like, crap. What do I say? I got to be cool, you know. Um, and that was the first time I interviewed somebody mega famous, I think. Um, and then it happened a little bit more in sports. So I just talked to him like regular people. I'm not trying to get a scoop, and I always sort of I don't really want to get into like. You know, who, if you're, I'm talking to celebrity, like who you're dating, that's kind of none of my business. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of not that exciting anyway, but I want to, I guess to me, I've always wanted to talk to people who are extremely accomplished as real people to kind of find out what they do, you know, what songs they play air, air guitar to, what's their favorite go-to snack in the middle of the night? Like, what do they, what do they think about when they're stressing out doing their work and, you know, being creative? So I just always approach it that way, I think be real with people. And I found that if you ask for, for what you want in life, a lot of times you will get it. You just got to kind of believe in yourself and, you know, believe in the process. That's awesome. That's just awesome overarching advice in general. Truly. Yeah. I've gotten to do a lot of cool things, especially in, in sports writing. I've gotten to, you know, travel to different places and hang out with athletes. I mean, it was one cool part of the, I guess the aftermath of COVID is that we all use we all use Zoom now, whereas before 
I was doing interviews on the phone and, and the audio wasn't that great. So then by the time, uh, second time I got emailed about Shaq is doing this thing, you know, it was like, yeah, we're going to get you a Zoom with Shaq, which is to me blows my mind that I'm talking to Shaquille O'Neal like you and I are talking now. Um, I have a friend named Jim Ryan who basically does what I do, and he, but he's all music. And he's done Zooms with and interviews with. Uh, the first big one that made me say, wow, was Ringo Starr. He's like, yeah, I'm doing a Zoom with Ringo Starr tomorrow. I'm like, holy shit, dude. Like, Ringo. Uh, then he did one with Brian May of Queen. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, a dozen other people the same caliber since. If he told me tomorrow he's, you know, doing one with Robert Plant or Jimmy Page, like, I wouldn't be surprised because that's where we are now. And that's, you know, he's built a reputation for being a good interviewer, like I hope I have. So, again, cool stuff happens. We're at an age where... Uh, you can, you know, get a hold of people more than you could in the 80s for sure. Well, thank you so much for being here with me. Tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, if you want to check out the book, either for yourself or, you know, the holidays are coming up, you got to buy for, for people. If you've got friends who love music or a crazy uncle who's really into the 90s or whatever, uh, 90daysinthe90s.com. Uh, if you order direct from me, I'll send you a book. Or make it out to whoever you want and send you some swag too. Otherwise, you, you know, you can buy it on Amazon, obviously. Um, everything's available on Amazon. But I also tell people, like, if you've got a local bookstore that's independent, owned by someone you know or, you know, neighbor of yours, they may not have 90 Days in the 90s in stock, but you might want to throw some business their way and order it from them and they can get it in a couple of days. So I just say support the local business just like you would on Record Store Day. Um, but, yeah, you can find 90 Days in the 90s pretty much at anywhere, um, Kindle or, or paperback. I don't have an audio book yet, but, you know. We like to keep it old school a little bit. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye. That's a wrap for this week. If you like Nostalgia, please connect with me on social. Subscribe to the Nostalgia newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com and follow, rate, review on your platform of choice. Everything's linked in the show notes, including where to find more about our guest of the week. Thank you so, so much for your support. And that was this week's episode of Nostalgia.